And because of her kind of reputation and popularity, I don't know if I want to call it that, she had a lot of uh, male suitors that were interested in her. Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah, but she turned them all down. Um, she felt that she was kind of called singleness and that she wanted all her longings and affections to be wrapped up in her service to God. Welcome back to another episode of Him Partial, the podcast where we talk all things church music. I'm Kara Devereaux. And I'm Monet Funke. And in today's episode, we are talking about Fanny Ridley Havergal, also known as Frances Ridley Havergal, the writer of Take My Life and Let It Be. I was very encouraged about these lyrics and I cannot wait to dig in. But first, if you're listening on YouTube, hit subscribe and ring the bell so that you're notified when we drop a new episode. We're also available anywhere you listen to podcasts. And if you want to leave us a five star review, that would be smashing. There's still time to enter our giveaway um, sponsored by The Banner of Truth, where you can win a four volume set of the works of John Newton that ends on the 15th, which is next Monday. Um, So you better head over to himpartial.com and sign up today. So today's topic is the hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be, written by, as I said, Frances Ridley Havergal. We will spend some time talking about the author herself um, because I think she was quite an accomplished lady uh, of her day. So we'll just dig right in. And spoiler alert, I'm going to mispronounce a lot of things today. (laughs) And we're just going to dive right into that. Um, She was born in 1836 in Worcestershire. (laughs) That was pretty good. You're okay. fine. Okay, because that's good. a place no American can say. I just think Worcestershire sauce. It's one of my favorite memes. Really? <laughs> the one where it's like three hardest things to say. Is it? I'm sorry. Um, something else. Yeah. And then it's like Worcestershire sauce. <laughs> I have seen that meme, and yes, those are hard things to say. Um, but that's where she was from. Um, And like I said, I kind of gave it away a little bit in the intro. She was actually known as Fanny. Like that's how people called her, which I never thought of a shortening of Francis being Fanny. I thought it would be like Fran or like Frankie or something like that. Um, But yeah, that's that's how she was known um, amongst her friends and family. Um, So she joins the club of another famous Fanny, Fanny Crosby of people who have that name in our hymn writers. <laughs> um, so she was actually born into a Victorian upper middle class family. She spent the first five of her years uh, in Worcestershire, <laughs> where she was born. Um, there she had unhindered freedom to roam the countryside. And then when she was five, uh, her family moved to Worcester. <laughs> I don't think I said that better. You did okay. Yeah. It's okay. fine. Um, there, uh, her her father described her as a caged lark um, because she obviously just loved the outdoors so much. And that would kind of remain with her throughout her lifetime. So when, when Franny was 11 years old, her mother died. This was really hard for her. Um, this is actually kind of like marked a, a part in her life where she basically was like, I don't want to have anything to do with God. It's really sad. Yeah. I mean, she's 11. Um, and I think folks around her were trying to say, this is the sovereignty of God. Like God's hand is in this. Mm. Like you, you know, trying to encourage her in those ways where she was like having none of it. Uh, but God had the final say, of course, cause we're talking about her today. Um, but just a little bit more about her, her upbringing. Uh, She was incredibly intelligent. Uh, By the age of four, she could read and write. Um, When she was 13, she went to a boarding school in Kensington, London. Um, There, the girls were required to speak in French um, at all times. Uh, And then the secondary language was Italian. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And the girls were, um, were trained up, I guess, in music and art, which were considered... Um, important to prepare girls for society, society life. Yep. Um, she also learned Greek and Hebrew <laughs> and began writing poetry at quite a young age, uh, though she never really considered herself a poet and was highly, highly critical of her own work. You're smiling. <laughs> I just think that's sweet. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, I don't want to say it was false humility, but I do feel like she, she wasn't, she was like, no, no, no. She was far too critical of her own work and she ended I up being fairly talented. Sometimes because you're used to living in your own head, you don't have that perspective. Like, you know how you think. And so yeah. it's not that novel or smart to you because that's what you live with. Yeah. But like, sometimes other people are like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so one of her teachers, when when she was at this French school in London, her name was Miss Teed. Um, so Miss Teed taught dance, but while Fanny was there, uh, Miss Teed experienced a conversion to Christianity. And she basically was like, nope, I'm not teaching dance anymore. I'm now teaching scripture. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I was like, right on. So her lessons basically emphasized memorizing long passages of scripture, including whole books of the Bible, the Gospels, the Psalms, Isaiah. Um, and Fanny took to this really well because she was so clever. Um, and she basically committed all these passages to memory. Um long before the Lord had saved her, which is it's clever of the Lord. Yeah. It's amazing how he lays the groundwork, isn't right? it? Things you'd never expect. <laughs> right, right. Um, and it was interesting too, because obviously her mother passed away mm. um, when she was 11 and that she kind of hardened her heart. And then she meets this teacher and the teacher's like, Bible, Bible, Bible. But the craziest thing about it is that Fanny's father was actually, actually a rector in the Anglican church, which I... Now that I'm saying that, I actually don't know if a rector is the exact title of what he did, but he basically was the musician and hymn writer for this church. Yeah, we've come across a few <laughs> ranks in the Anglican church that we don't understand. Don't get them. We're just like, they're all just pastors. We don't know. Yeah. Um, if there's anybody out there who is well versed in Anglican <laughs> hierarchy, we would love like if you got a little picture diagram or something, that'd yes. be amazing. <laughs> that would be great. We we could really use uh, the education maybe. Um, but yeah, so she obviously had, the Lord was like, you know, she might've thought she knew where she was going, but the Lord was, was lining this up for her, um, surrounding her with Christians and, and surrounding her with his word, which is really, really exciting. So yeah, Fanny's father, rector in the Anglican church, they were really close, the two of them. Um, and later on in uh, Fanny's teenage years, her father's failing eyesight um, basically led them to Germany, mm. where Fanny accompanied him because they were thick as thieves. And um, there she attended a German girl school. So here's another language. She also learned German. <laughs> so he went to Germany for treatment for treatment. his eyes. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Cool. No, you're fine. Um, I was just like, that's a random place. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was like some Prussian specialist there. Mm. I don't know. I think this is something that we take for granted. This is totally a, a tangent, but you know, we have NHS here and most, most healthcare systems, whether you think they're fantastic or terrible, they kind of have specialists in all their fields, like within the country. Yeah. But Back in the day, it's like, oh, my eyes are weird. Where who's good at eyes? This dude in Germany. Okay, well, I yeah. guess we're getting on a train. We're talking Victorian era. Yeah. Just to give you context. Yeah, like. yeah. So, um, so yeah, she learned German while she was in Germany. Um, she also was quite a talented singer. So kind of wherever their family traveled, she was always kind of asked to sing all over the UK, Germany, Switzerland, etc. So she was just really overly talented the lord gave her a bunch of talents <laughs> quite quite literally um and because of her kind of reputation and popularity i don't know if i want to call it that she had a lot of uh male suitors that were interested in her <laughs> oh gosh <laughs> yeah but she turned them all down um she felt that she was kind of called singleness and that she wanted all her longings and affections to be wrapped up in her service to God. Okay. So. That was pretty, I don't want to say extreme, but unusual for that day. Like marriage was the done yeah. thing. Like I don't think we grasp now Yeah. how, like, if you don't get married, like, what are you even doing with your life? For women. Yeah. In that era. For women. And I, I think maybe just because she kind of had like a 
like a cushy life maybe yeah. it wasn't so much of a priority and for if, her if you've got your pick of suitors you're yeah. kind of like hmm yeah interesting choice okay yeah so that was kind of her upbringing it, it so i guess this is like leaving off with her being like around 13 years old it was a few li- years later that fanny confided in a family friend that she had this spiritual unrest i remember when her mom died she was like peace out god mm. And she's getting saturated with the Bible. Her dad's a rector. Like, you know, she's just can't like, get away you know, from it. she can't get away from it. So she confided in this friend. Um, and it basically was from that day forward that uh, she had turned to the Lord in service. So of the experience, she wrote there. And then I committed my soul to the savior and earth and heaven seemed bright from that moment. I did trust the Lord Jesus. So that was like, maybe she was like around 15 years old. Now, despite this clear moment, Fanny struggled a lot with assurance throughout her life. Um, So even though she professed faith from her teenage years, she always felt that there was something missing from her, from her spiritual life, Mm -hmm. uh, which left her with this reoccurring kind of doubt. Um, So it wasn't until 1873, when she was 37 years old, that she finally felt that long lasting assurance. Um, And she shares with her sister in a letter, it was made plain to me that he who had thus cleansed me had power to keep me clean. So I utterly yielded myself to him to keep me. Which I think is just another example. Right. It's just another example of how beautifully she writes. This is just a letter to her sister. And it's like, so, so wonderfully written. Yeah. Um, so it was after this time that all of her hymns that we know were written. Okay. So it was after she turned 37, basically. She was like, no, this is real. Which I think is kind of encouraging because sometimes we read these authors' backgrounds and we're like, wow, he wrote that amazing song when he was 16. And then mm-hmm. like 18, he was wilding out. And then 25, he was like, who is God? You know, so yeah. it's kind of nice where she like kind of went through her journey. And then it's not to say that those songs or rubbish or anything but it is nice to know that she was kind of like no it's real now she has such an ordinary story as well like yeah as a young woman like just growing up in a christian home having that loss yeah and then kind of just trying to not have anything to do with the faith but god kind of just brought her back and i love that that's like it's not particularly remarkable in a sort of flashbang kind of way but (laughs) it is it is. It, it is lovely that it's just a really normal, this yeah. is how a lot of people come to faith story. I think it's lovely to hear people's testimonies, full stop. Yeah. Another, ta- another tangent. But I do think it's wonderful because to know the moment that the Lord saved you, like mm. that's so special. I can't necessarily say that of myself. I feel like there was a time when I was like, no, thank you, God. And then there was a time when I was like, amen. And I was safe sometime in yeah. between then. I just was yeah. like, okay. I can tell you like this was the moment it clicked. It was like yeah. more like waking up slowly. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Anyway. So now for the song. Yeah. Sorry. I was going to say quick thing. Um, a little t- life tip for you. Um, ask other believers in your life how they got saved. It's great. Yeah. It's so nice to hear. Oh, it's so encouraging. I love it. Genuinely love it. Um. So the song, <laughs> we learned, we learned about Francis <laughs> and now we're going to learn about the song. So sometimes when we do these histories of a song, we're kind of like, okay, here's all this stuff about the author. Cause we really kind of don't know the history of the song, but that is not the case for this song. We know the exact history of this. So luckily we actually have Francis's own words oh. where she's speaking about how this song came about. So This is what she said, quote, perhaps you'll be interested to know the origin of the consecration hymn, Take My Life. I went for a visit of five days to um, this house in Worcestershire. Uh, There were 10 persons in the house, some unconverted and long prayed for, some converted but not rejoicing Christians. The Lord gave uh, me a prayer. Lord, give me all in this house. And he just did. Before I left the house, everyone got a blessing. 
The last night of my visit, after I had retired, the governess asked me to go to the two daughters. They were crying. Then and there, both of them trusted and rejoiced. I was too happy to sleep and passed most of the night in praise and renewal of my own consecration. And these little couplets formed themselves and chimed in my heart one after another till they finished. Ah, oh, right? all the feelings. <laughs> That's, um, oh, yeah. Wow. I mean, we're literally just talking about how exciting it is to hear about yeah. conversions. And this that's what spurred like a whole house full of people being converted mm. um, that spurred on this song from her heart. It did make me smile, though, when she's like, some safe, but not rejoicing. Yeah. In it. I was like, oh, <laughs> ouch. <laughs> they needed a little pick me up or something. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's the history. What do you think? What do you think about that? I think it's slightly emotional, <laughs> um, but it's lovely. But it also shows her talent that, you know, the, she just had these words in her head. Yep, it makes me sick. <laughs> spun it together. I know. It's so crazy. So just a brief note on the tune before we jump into the lyrics, which is like, mm, the lyrics, I love them. So she was really close with her father, as we know. And it was his tune that she desired this song to be sung in. And the tune is called Patmos. However, no one sings this song to that tune. Not a single person. Uh, the most common tune sung with this song is Hendon by Henry A. Caesar Milan. So I think we were, I think before the show we were kind of humming the um, the version that I'm most familiar with, which is actually like a Chris Tomlin remix of the song. It's not like the full lyrics or anything like that. But um, my husband is more familiar with that, with the um, Hendon version. But did I you know that it was think, another? Yeah. You did? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think the early days of me singing this song would have been a different tune. Really? Not Hendon? I don't know what it's called, but not the one we were humming <laughs> no, no, no. earlier, a different like, one. Ba, na, 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 That's one, but there's also... I don't know that That's one, one I've sung it okay, too. Okay, maybe yeah. that's Patmos. I don't know what it's called. Yeah, if you've sung, if you could f decipher our little hums <laughs> right now... <laughs> Tell us which one you've actually sung it to. Because I, again, my first encounter with these lyrics was Chris Tomlin's version, which is sort of a play off of the Milan uh, tune, sort of, um, but different. Um, but not that one. I've never sung that one before. That's new. That one, you don't repeat the last line. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. All right, well. Anyway. Speaking of the lyrics why don't you just go ahead and do the honor of reading them before we just chat a bit about about them okay i absolutely love this song yeah just saying. <laughs> so the the lyrics are take my life and let it be consecrated lord to thee take my moments and my days let them flow in endless praise take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my king. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. Take my will and make it thine, it shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own, it shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever, only, all for thee. Yes, that's a great. Have you sung all six of those verses? Yep. Okay, okay. I'm pretty sure I have too, but I can't tell you for certain if I have. But I was reading through them and I was like, they all look familiar. Um, so I'm sure I've sung them all. I think occasionally people will drop one or two verses, mm -hmm. like if it's a conference or something and they don't want to like sing too long or <laughs> if they sing the tune really slowly, then yeah. they'll drop one or two. Yeah. No particular one or two. Yeah. Definitely sung all of them. Yeah. So there's a lot to unpack here. Um, one thing uh, to note is that Fanny was a firm believer 
that all of her writings had to be backed up by scripture. She's our kind of girl. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So to challenge her on that, I looked into this song um, and I think it was like hymnary.org had like all the reference verses and I kid you not, it was 63. Now you might think that's insane. It's it's only a six verse song, but it's, it's basically just picking up on everywhere in scripture where these themes are, are touched. And honestly, some of it is, is verbatim, but we're going to, we're just going to touch on a few because we could be here all day <laughs> reading 63 verses. It'll be, it'll just, we'll start our own audio Bible at this, at this yeah. point. <laughs> but if you want to go look it up, recommend it. <laughs> yeah. I love that site, him, himnary.org. Um, they really got a lot of useful information there. So, um, obviously the big theme of this song is consecration, <laughs> which is a $5 word just for being set apart for sacred use, or as we like to say, holy. So verse one in that opening verse, she's speaking about being consecrated to the Lord, being set apart for him. Where do we see that in scripture? Well, a bunch of places, <laughs> but one instance is in Leviticus 11.45. So Car, can you read that for us? Of course. So Leviticus 11.45 says, For I am the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy as I am holy. For I am holy. Sorry. Yep. Both are true, but one is scripture. <laughs> 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 no, it's true. So... I think I'm really encouraged that she just kind of, you know, she calls us the consecration hymn, which I thought, I don't know if you caught that in her little blurb about the background. Uh, and that's, that's the whole theme of this, of this um, hymn. And she starts it off basically pulling this theme straight from scripture. Consecrate me. Cause that's exactly what you told you, you told us, um, you know, I'm your, I'm your Lord. And I'm holy, so you be holy. Like, mm -hmm. that's it. And I'm, I'm just like, boom, that's real simple. I like that. <laughs> Any thoughts on that, Cara? No, you're right. Yeah. And I love the fact that she's like, well, you've told me to be holy, so yeah. you're going to go help a girl out. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, in the second verse, she asks for the Lord to prosper our hands and make our feet beautiful. You probably know which verse I'm going to go to. I do, to. because, so I have this friend and... Actually, last week we were tracting, we were um, giving out gospel leaflets in a village um, in Fife and her mom, I think it was, texted and was just like, I just want to remind you guys, you have beautiful feet. <laughs> um, and that sounds super weird. It does. <laughs> um, but it does come from this verse. It does come from this verse. So if you could read for us Isaiah 52, 7, please. Yep. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Amen. Amen. We also have a, a mutual friend who I feel like constantly encourages that, encourages us this way whenever we're out doing some sort of evangelism mm -hmm. and says, your feet are, your feet are so beautiful. It's like, they don't feel beautiful. They feel yeah. sore. <laughs> it's like, ouchie, but it is, it is a, it's a wonderful image from scripture. Cause you'd think this, I mean, the way it was described to me, don't at me if I've got this wrong, but the way it was described to me is like, whenever like someone would win a war or something like that, or the king was coming or whatever, like they would send a messenger and he would like book it like Usain Bolt, like to the next village yeah. to tell the news. These guys make marathon runners look like wimps. Yeah. <laughs> and you think, well, how beautiful are his feet? Well, his feet are probably jacked up. Let's be honest. They're probably yeah. blistered and bleeding, but the, the news that they bring is so good. Yeah, that, that you're, you're like, like bless yes, the feet bless that brought you feet, here. You know? <laughs> so maybe there's a metaphor in there for the Christian life. <laughs> maybe we need to, you guys need to start saying it too. Yeah. Like if you need to encourage someone, just be like, you got beautiful feet, yeah, beautiful keep preaching feet. that gospel. <laughs> <laughs> it's very true, it's very true. 
So there are six verses. Don't worry. We're not going to do all six. I just wanted to pick out one more because I really like this verse. And because I'm a co-host, I get to choose. So <laughs> in verse five of the song, um, she writes, take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. And this is like the heart of the song for me. I know there are a lot of songs out there where we like make empty promises to God, like, Oh Lord, I will follow you. I'll do whatever you want. I'll this, all yeah. that. Right. But this verse is like pleading with the Lord, like, Lord, can you do this? Can you actually make my will yours? Because on my own devices, it's not happening, yeah. you know? Um, and we obviously see this all over scripture, we have a million examples, obviously the best examples from Christ, our Lord, you know, mm. asking for the Lord's will to be done. Um, but I decided to look at Psalm 143.10. So Cara, do you mind reading that for us? Of course. Psalm 143.10. Teach me to do your will for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. Yes. Yes. And I think that's kind of, that's a good note to end these on. Um, you know, like, like Francis, Fanny, whatever you want to call her. Um, she believed her writings had to be backed by scripture and we believe all good hymns are backed by scripture. Um, and so it is another tool to teach us. It's another tool to help us learn the will of God and to sing this as a song of praise. It's almost like a prayer as well. Mm. Um, I love, sorry, I love that fifth verse as well when it says about uh, make, make my, your will, my will, because, you know, you were saying about all those other songs that are like, Oh God, I'm going to do this for you. And it's like, you can't, unless your will is aligned with his will. And Mm -hmm. then everything else becomes something that you want to do and you're able to do. Yeah. So that's kind of like the key thing. But I also love the last line where it's ever, always, all for thee. I'm like, yes. That's right. I didn't even ask you what your favorite verse of this song is. I don't have one. (laughs) it's, it's, It's all good. And yeah. Yeah, I just love it. And it's really easy to sing, but it's so much harder to live out in real life. <laughs> yeah. Well, it is It is a good prayer, I think, for mm. anyone out there who's like, yep, that sounds nice, but that's not me. You could still, this, still sing this song, um, you know, as a prayer to the Lord to do yeah. these things in your life. It's not you yet. No. And that's why we sing this song, yes. because if we'd made it, we wouldn't need it. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, um, it's a great hymn. I absolutely love this one. It was one of the first ones I attempted to memorize as a, a young Ooh. youngster. I do not have it in my brain anymore, <laughs> but maybe I, I need to recommit it to memory. Yeah. So yeah, um, that was a really great hymn. It was lovely to hear all of scripture. Uh, thanks for sharing that with us. Just a reminder, guys, that the giveaway is still on. You can go to himpartial.com to find out how to enter into that and until next week may the lord bless and keep you bye Bye.